Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we continue the study we started last week on revival, a heart for revival, uh, primarily coming from the book of Nehemiah, mm -hmm. and that's where I'm going to start reading from as we start. Good. Which is where we left off. That's right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read verse 6. We were, we were part of the way through verse 6. Mm -hmm. But we'll do that right at the mark asks for God's blessing to give us understanding of his word. Oh, well, Lord, open up our ears to hear your word and our eyes so we can apply it. And just we thank you for your word. Amen. Amen. All righty then. Nehemiah. This is a book of revival and, and its process. And it is a process. We talked about that a little bit last week. So let me just kind of review that. The process of revival, it has to start with recognizing that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And that has to lead to remorse. If there's a problem, you've got to be concerned with it. You have to be remorseful about it. Otherwise, you'll not take any action to correct it. Right? And that should lead to repentance. Mm -hmm. And that will lead to revival. But that, of course, is not the end of the story. Because when, it, <clears throat> when there's true revival, that's going to lead to renewal. And that renewal will lead to restoration. Reformation, and, restoration. And relocation. Ah, that's a new one. Well, I got a destination in mind, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Okay. So we, we ended last week, as I said, in verse 6. I want to just read verse 6 and then we'll pick it up, right? Mm -hmm. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Yes, I and my father, my father's house have sinned. He said, I'm praying before you now. He said this to the Lord. Ezra, and remember, Ezra is, this started out as the book of Ezra and the Ezra and Nehemiah was split just because of the length of it, right? Ezra was say, saying, and I'm going to read from verse, chapter 8, verses 21 to 22. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Hava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way, because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him but his power and anger against all those who forsake him. He didn't seek the help of the world because he was proclaiming and professing the salvation of God. And he didn't want any of God's glory to be taken away, right? Uh, yes. He didn't seek the help of the world. And this is the verse we, and and I quoted uh, Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. God has to be. Now, you know, God can use anything he wants. But the fact of the matter is, we have to be seeing God as the source of everything that we need and our help, all right? Absolutely everything. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. if you're proclaiming that you're trusting in God, and then you turn to the world and trust in the world, mm -hmm. you can be destroying the testimony that you should have. That's right. And you don't want to destroy your testimony. And you don't want to turn to, when we're talking about revival, you don't want to turn to, to the world or worldly church programs to accomplish the plan of God. Mm. Right? Yeah, I'm sure you all know this verse, Isaiah 55. God spoke through Isaiah and said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. What did I say? Isaiah 55. Nor are your ways my ways. No. That's, that's <laughs> For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. That's why he says in Proverbs, lean not on your own understanding. We have to be his led by the are, Spirit, right? His ways are always so much higher. Because the flesh, the natural, and fleshly programs for revival give birth. Well, I can't say it as well as Jesus did, so I'll just tell you what he said. Yeah. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, John 3, 6. So if you're doing something in the flesh, it's only going to give birth to something fleshly, mm. all right? Mm. 
You know, years ago, uh, a dear brother who's now going to be with the Lord, uh, a pastor of a church in Winter Park, where I had a lot of fellowship with his, mm. with his brother, Robert Dunlop was his name. And he and I were invited to go to a Gideon's, you know, the Gideon Bible Society. He, we were invited to go to a prayer breakfast for, for, for pastors, pastors. Uh, in Orlando. And not not a lot, maybe, well, I say not a lot, maybe a hundred pastors. I don't think it was that many. You said it was, a, 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 he he was expecting a better turnout than yeah, it well, was. So we, it was a breakfast meeting, mm. breakfast prayer meeting, and uh, there were tables of, I think, 10, either 10 or 12 people. And Robert and I were sitting with, uh, I'll say, 10 other pastors at this one table. And those the other fellows, they were talking about growing their churches talking about revival, talking about things like that. And they were talking about the plans they had, the programs that they were planning on running to stimulate growth in their congregations. And I sat there and listened for a little bit, and then I spoke up and said, isn't it interesting that as I listen to you and consider all the things that might make your, you consider all the things that might make your church grow, make it more attractive to people, and really, is what they were saying. Mm -hmm. What came to my mind were the words of the prophet Isaiah. When he said, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Speaking of Jesus, he says, for he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Isaiah 53, 1 and 2. I don't believe that I made a lot of new friends that, at that meeting that morning. I really don't, because... Uh, I don't, but that's what they consider church growth. Well, that's the thing, how, how they get it, by making everything more attractive, make the building more attractive, make the program more attractive, make the music more attractive. But that wasn't God's plan. I mean, God said he would draw them in. Well, well, the thing is, I mean... It, his plan was Jesus Christ, and That's Jesus right. Christ had no form that men would be attracted to him, all right? The cross. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. The word of the cross. And that is the most horrible event that has ever been seen on the face of the earth. That is the most wonderful event that has yes. ever been seen on the face of the earth. And yes, it can be both at the same time. Mm -hmm. The word of the cross. The Apostle Paul wrote, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. That's God's plan. Mm -hmm. that, that horror, the cross, that was God's plan to draw men to him, the Father. Right? Uh, just as an aside, Alice and I were at a grocery store down in South Orlando a week or two ago. And as we were coming out, there was a table set out up, set up outside and there were people there and they were trying to get Petitions. people and they're trying to get us to sign a petition mm -hmm. because they were trying to bring another power company into that area of town and I, I looked at I talked to them a bit and I said you know are you really concerned about power and they said yeah I said well the word of the cross is the power of God unto salvation that is the power that is the power well, we yeah, wound up having a little church outside yes, of Publix yeah, that day. Yes, yeah. yeah, it was good. That is, the word of the cross, the power of God. No wonder we don't see much real revival in this day and in this day and in this age of attractive buildings, great bands and light shows, multimedia presentations, cafes in the churches, and inspirational messages from the pulpit on how to be healthier, wealthier, and more successful in life. The word of the cross Hallelujah. is what will draw men to him. So Nehemiah said, I am praying before you now, to talking to the Lord, I'm praying before you night and day and night. You know, it says in, in James, in James chapter five, that Elijah was a, a man with a nature like our, ours, and he prayed earnestly, right? Mm -hmm. He is the example that is given there as earnest and effective prayer. The effective prayer of a righteous man availed much. But Elijah didn't just pray casually. He prayed earnestly. You know, the Greek word that's used here actually says he prayed prayer. <laughs> I, I like that. That's what it says literally in the Greek. He prayed prayer. 
Jesus never prayed casually. No. No. Never. Think about this from the Gospel of Luke, the 22nd chapter. I'm going to read verses 41 to 44. And he, Jesus, withdrew from them, the apostles, about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Nevertheless, your will, right? Mm -hmm. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like blood, drops of blood, falling down upon the ground. That's not casual prayer by any means. Do we really want to see revival? Casual prayer is not going to do the trick. So Nehemiah goes on and says, Confessing the sins of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. One of the key factors in revival is accepting the blame for it not being there, all right? The very first result of man's, Adam's sin, was to try and hide. Not true? Mm-hmm. It says in Genesis 3, 7 and 8, Then the eyes of both of them, the man and the woman, were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They left him. That's what happens. Because sin separates you from God. And then, Adam blamed everybody but himself. That's right. Right? I mean, who you got there? See this picture in the garden? There is, there is God Almighty. There is Adam. And there is the woman. And Adam says... And the man said, the woman who you gave me, thou gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. It was her fault, it was your fault. All right, all right. That's the first thing that you see about fallen human nature. Excuse. You'll blame everybody else. Excuses? Excuses are the fiery arrow shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. There was no repentance. Don't make excuses. Confess your sins. Mm-hmm. You know, good practice? It says confess your sins one to another, right? All right? The third step of this process is to repent, right? Mm-hmm. And that should, what we've just talked about, that should lead to repentance. In verse 7, it says, We have acted very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which thou didst command thy servant Moses. And then Ezra, and again, I kind of bounce back and forth sometimes between Nehemiah and Ezra. Ezra said, but because our fathers had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed this temple and deported the people to Babylon. Ezra 5, 12. You know the answer. I mean, we, we got a lot of problems in this country, like every other country. I mean, we're not unique in that. But I'm sure you know, are familiar with this verse. Second Chronicles 7.14. God said, And my, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Yes. We'll keep trying to change all those people out there. We have to change us. The church has to change. The church has to humble itself, repent of its wicked ways before God's going to move. All right? I'm, I'm telling you the truth. You know, I, I want to I talk about a really great picture of this process of repentance to revival, right? But I want to tell you just a little story. Alice and I, you know, we travel and spend a lot of time in the United Kingdom, and that was our base. We'd go over there for half a year or more and work out all through the United Kingdom, all through England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland. That's not UK. Northern Ireland is. (laughs) But Ireland, too. And when we'd go over, as a matter of fact, we had gotten into London one time. And one of the first things I would do, and this was a number of years ago when Wi-Fi wasn't as readily oh, available right. around the country. I'd go to a, a mobile place, 
they call them mobile bases, you know, telephone. To get um, service. I, yeah. I, and I would buy a little dongle that you could put in the laptop, mm -hmm. and that would give you internet service mm -hmm. as we traveled around the country. Mm -hmm. And I had done that a number of times before. But I, So this one year we went over and I did that, and I bought it, and I couldn't get it to work properly. So I called customer service, I believe it was T-Mobile, not to name any names, and called their customer service, and I got a fellow, and uh, he said to me, he said, I see you're calling from London. I said, yeah. He said, but you sound like you're an American. I said, I am. He said, are you there on holiday? I love that. And there I was the opening. There was the opening. <laughs> I said, where are you? He said, I'm in the Philippines. I said, I'm here to tell people and teach people about the love of God, the Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ. That's what I do. I said, do you know about Jesus Christ? And there was a very, very pregnant pause at the other end of the line. And then a voice that was cracking with emotion, he said to me, I was a Christian, but I've fallen away, and I've done so much wrong. He said, I'm sure that God would not accept me back. And I said to him, have you ever heard the account of the prodigal son? And he said, yes. So I just kind of recounted that a little bit. And I said to him, our father is waiting for you to come home. He broke down in tears. He's in a call center. You know, there's people all around him. And he broke down in tears. And he and I prayed together. He and I prayed together passionately. And I said, welcome home. It was joy. I mean, there was such joy. So I prayed with him again and hung up and went away. I never, I didn't get my, never I never got to, I never got the dongle problem. fixed. I was like, you know, just who cares? Yeah, that wasn't the whole reason. Yeah, I didn't need that to communicate no. with him and to communicate with heaven. But you see, what an amazing picture of falling into sin. The results of that, recognizing that remorse and repentance, they're all seen in that wonderful message of the prodigal told by Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take the time, just a moment or two, to read that, okay? Yeah. Because it's so important to what we're talking about. I'm reading from Luke 15, starting at verse 11. And he, Jesus, said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth be between them, and not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. Why do you think that famine was there? God caused it. God caused it. Mm -hmm. Maybe just for this man. Mm -hmm. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving him any, anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf. Kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. He was dead, but now alive. That's revival. That's revival. It was revival. He, he was a son of the father. Mm -hmm. But yet he had fallen away. When he recognized what he had done and repented, he recognized it and repented and returned. And it was restored. His father was, his father was so eagerly waiting for, mm. you know, if you've not right, if you've fallen away from a right relationship with the Lord, I promise you, the father is waiting for you to return. 
He's waiting for his son. He has no desire to punish you. Mm -hmm. He has a desire to restore you. I'm telling you. And of course, the other, the other, the older brother didn't like that. No, he was jealous. He was jealous. You know, he's he was faithful, and and, and the father's throwing him this party. What How often mean? is the church looking for a more successful church than restored souls? Mm. And let's talk about the next step: renewal. All right, it, it goes from that repentance to renewal. In verse eight and nine, here in Nehemiah, he said. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandment and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. If you will return and keep my commandments. That's key. All right. I mean, once you revive, you got to get back into a right relationship with it. The reason you had to return was because you got out of that right relationship. When Lazarus had his revival, and that was a good revival, wasn't it? Called out of death from the grave by Jesus. When that, when that happened, he was still wrapped. When he came out of that grave, he was still wrapped in the garments of death. Yes. The grave clothes. The first thing that Jesus said to those around him was, unbind him and let him go. When we are called into new life, we need to be freed from the old habits, the old traditions, the old ways of thinking. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, as Paul wrote to the church at Rome in the 8th chapter, right? The 12th chapter, thank you. Okay. Romans 12, too. Okay. That's why we need to have the helmet of salvation. Absolutely. But you've got to be transformed now. Yeah. Okay? A new or renewed life demands a new lifestyle. You've got to live different. Okay? Revival has to be visible. It has to be visible by the fruit of the Holy Spirit and not by a head count. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, most people talk about revival, they'll start saying, well, there's many people. No, no. It's got to be... This individual who's now walking in the fruit of the Spirit. That's the, that's the sign of revival. Okay? You know them by their fruits. That's what he said. No, but you, I mean, all you hear is, well, this many people showed up. No, it was the devil that caused David to number the people. You better be careful about your head counts, I'll tell you what. All right? Uh, okay, let's move on to chapter 2. Verse 1. And it came about in the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Asher, Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took the wine up and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been in his presence. Now, this is about four months of, after Nehemiah started praying and fasting. The Lord brings about this event that starts the ball rolling, brings him into the presence of the king, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'll tell you what, those who are faithful, they'll stand in the presence of kings, yes. All that said, now I have not been be, be four times sad in his presence. So that was d different. Well, praying made it, the, the burden of praying and that made him sad, made change his countenance. Made him sad. I made him unsad. Yes, he was joyful. Well, when, why did he say here he's sad? I had not, not been sad, sad in his presence. Okay. But he was sad now. Right. Well, what's he said for? The people. <clears throat> the what people. They, what they've done. Yes. He's he's remorseful. Is it possible? Let me ask you a question. Is, is it possible to be sad and joyful at the same time? Yes. Yes. Why? Because we are fearfully. Well, enough because sad is a reaction. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Okay. Well, one is the flesh, and one is the spirit. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a natural thing. I mean, you know, our compassion, our concern for others. Yeah. That's, but that does that should, that will should never remove the joy, joy of the Holy Spirit. Right, right. Okay, that's the difference between joy and being happy. I exactly. mean, yeah. the joy of the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, is not affected by circumstance. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's not get too far off, right? Mm -hmm. But think about this: for when he's praying for four months, when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater. 
he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. That's Hebrews 6, 13 and 15. You, know, you hear a lot of talk about, well, now faith. But the simple fact of the matter is, having patiently waited, he received the promise. God's timing is perfect timing. Yours is not necessarily so. Okay. There are not always instant answers, but we have to learn to persevere, right? To press on. Naaman the leper, right? He had to dip into Jordan seven times. Five wouldn't do the trick. Six wouldn't do the trick. There's an appointed time for everything. All right, let me read verses 7 and 8 in that second chapter. And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress, which is by the temple, for the wall of the city, and for the house which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. You know, it's all right to seek favor <clears throat> in the world mm -hmm. based on what God is doing. Right. All right. You can't you just can't be dependent on the world He's because they are not the source. He is. All right. Well, he would have gotten that instruction from the Lord. Right. Well, yeah, he did. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, you know, I, I want to share a quick thing because we're running out of time already. Back in 1981 or 82, as Alice and I were traveling around the country ministering, we, we happened to be in Orlando, just passing through. And God spoke to me. I mean, and it was very, very distinct. He woke me up in the middle of the night. And you were up all night. You no, know, we had been praying for <coughs> Cuba. We had been praying for a moving of the Spirit in Cuba for years. Right. Now, uh, this is well before there was any good... Uh, Cuba was totally closed to Americans, right? So as we traveled, it was my practice, as the Lord led me, to get people to be praying for a moving of the Spirit in, in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So here this night, God woke me up and told me to do something, to go and get people in Orlando, get the church in Orlando to come together to pray. Not to pray for them, not to pray for a moving of the church in the Spirit in Orlando, but to totally put aside anything of ourselves and pray for the church, in Cuba. the believers, for the believers in Cuba, and for a revival in Cuba. He told me exactly where to have it, which was in a, a big football stadium, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he told me what I should pay for it, and he told me when it should be. So I started to go around to churches and tell them, but first I, I went to the city, and I told them that I needed this football stadium and I told them what for and I told them when and the, the fellow who manages this in the city said to me well, that's impossible he said because we're actually resodding the field there and we, we've just turned down a group you may have heard of they wanted to rent this for a concert called the who the who you remember here the who they wanted to rent the stadium and could not and I said to the man, I said, listen, I, I, I can really appreciate that. I said, but God told me mm -hmm. that this is the date I'm supposed to have it, and this is where I'm supposed to have it. And he said, yeah, but I just, uh, I said, I said, I know, but God told me. So we go on, and I'm talking to him, and I said, by the way, he also told me what I should pay. You're supposed to give it to us for free. Well, that turned his face white. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you that before I walked out, he agreed to let us use that stadium on that day and for free. Yes. The only thing I had to tell him was that we wouldn't get on the field and damage the field. They were going to give us the entire football stadium in, Flo in Orlando, Florida to use for free for prayer. And I went around from church to church all over Orlando. I can only tell you, like I went to one church. And I, and I said, listen, I, I know you don't know me. And you have to test the spirits. I said, but this is what God told me. And you pray about it and see. So this one church I went to, just for an example, mm. they said, well, it's interesting because our, our leadership is going away for a retreat this weekend. And I promise you, we'll pray about it. So a little later on, I went back and I said, did you pray about it? And he said, yes. And he said, we know that, that's from God. He said, but 
and then gave me the excuse why they wouldn't be able to make it. Right. And that happened over and over and over and over as I visited churches. Yes. The excuses. There was one little Spanish church that showed up at the football stadium. We didn't go in because I wasn't going to use it with that number of people. But we went to the grounds of the stadium we the and games. we prayed for a moving of the Spirit in Cuba. It's a handful of us. I, I can only tell you this because I, I'm not going to have time for the whole story. But I wound up going to Cuba. Mm-hmm. I wound up going to Cuba, and I wound up going and ministering to pastors from all over Cuba. Mm -hmm. And it was an amazing, mighty move of God. Amen. And one of the people, he was the chaplain. He, was, he came around as, as my interpreter, so when I preached, he would interpret. And he was the head chaplain for the prison system in Cuba. Mm -hmm. And we we're, we were sharing and talking one day as we were traveling. And he said, you know... Wherever the Word of God is being preached, people are being saved. This is revival. And he looked at me. He was an older man. He looked at me with this smile on his face I'll never forget. And he said, you know what? Even where the Word of God is not being preached, people are being saved. There was a mighty moving of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of true prayer and a heart after God. So, Father, we thank you, thank you Jesus. that you are an all-powerful God and nothing is impossible with you. Lord, give us a heart for revival. Give us a heart, Lord God, to see a church reformed, renewed, and just operating in your strength and power, dedicated to glorifying you. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you've given us the guidelines for this. That you showed us the way, Lord God. It's not to do anything but to glorify you, trust in you, and do the things that you call us to. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Well, be back next week as we carry on with our heart for revival. God bless you and goodbye. Bye-bye.